Hello, everyone, and it's our pleasure today to uh, welcome to Google John Yen, Jim Jansen, and Luke Zhang, who are going to be talking about information seeking, visualization, and decision making. And uh, John's going to be first. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm from Penn State College of Information Sciences and Technology. Uh, before we go into the, uh, the research, I just want to say a few words about uh, the college, the vision, and, and what brought us here. Uh, we all know the information explosion is the uh, excitement uh, that we see in the Google campus as well as around the world. Uh, and then you know, the transformation of data, to you know, all kinds of data, to information structure or unstructured or, or a wide range of media, uh, as well as translating that into knowledge and for people to use to make decisions and translating into wisdom is the uh, challenge we are all facing and try to improve and help the users with. And of course, global information is also becoming globally accessible, not only easier, but also in larger quantities, large volumes. Uh, so our college is, was created with this vision of uh, bringing information technology and the context information technology, which we usually use uh, the term people to capture, uh, but it's actually more than just the people, but also involve organization and the relationship between uh, people and groups and teams and organizations. Uh, our research uh, involved human computer interactions, uh, information, computational informatics, which deal with algorithm aspect of research, AI and cognitive science, looking at the understanding of human cognition to improve uh, information uh, processing knowledge uh, synthesis, and social and enterprise informatics, uh, looking at uh, the issues key from so sociology perspective, as well as impact to uh, enterprise, global enterprise. Uh, and finally, security, privacy, and trust is also important for us. In the strategic plan layout in the college recently, we identify uh, important drivers of the millennium, including the energy cost issues, uh, both energy costs and, and also uh, resources of energy, which is related, global warming, uh, the uh, new young generation, uh, which is, uh, has interesting characteristic, and the aging populations. Uh, as well as other characteristics such as uh, the uh, growth of a population in less developed countries and so forth. And these are help us to identify cross-cutting research directions that we think are important uh, in, uh, for the, for the uh, days to come, including the use of web not only for information search but also for social interactions you know, we have seen uh, the trend in the virtual world, which is uh, what, uh, direction in that, dire in that area. Uh, relational network science, which involves convergence of network science and social network and other kinds of related uh, disciplines. Uh, extreme event uh, has been important both for man-made and natural e extreme events. And how do we uh, help to have better preparation, better uh, principled analysis, not just uh, thinking about building systems, but also think about high level uh, science uh, related to understanding and analyzing. Um, all kinds of informatics beyond bio and health, uh, even you know, security informatics, uh, energy informatics, and so forth. A global self-awareness, how to help uh, you know, citizens uh, to be able to track uh, events, trends, and to better uh, respond to it, and finally, uh, the impact of technology on the change of culture uh, in the work environment and in education. In this particular talk, we will focus on three aspects of our research. Information seeking, which will be covered by Dr. Jim Jensen, and then uh, following that, uh, Dr. Luke Zhang will talk about knowledge visualization, and I'll talk about decision making, and touch a little bit on data mining uh, work related. Um, and the context of all of our talk is uh, certainly uh, uh, beyond individual, uh, in a, uh, oftentimes a collaborative uh, team or group um, context. So let me pass to Dr. Jin Jens. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me here and attending. And uh, my, uh, I have three, three daughters, and my 10-year-old daughter, when she found out I was coming to Google, we should, she said, be sure and tell them I loved all the Olympic logos that you did on the website. All right. So I want to pass that along. 
Uh, my particular topic is, uh, that I'm going to be kind of addressing is uh, information seeking. And it's a, it's a research area that covers the entire gamut of how people access and seek information, including cognitive and uh, affective things like my daughter and that logo, and also to very algorithmic things that deal with information searching. Uh, a particular uh, aspect I'm going to talk about is uh, uh, probabilistic user modeling, which is an important area in personalization. Uh, and uh, really used in all forms of, or a lot of forms of human computer interaction uh, in ways to make that uh, dynamic relationship between the user and the system better, right? Uh, a lot of the algorithmic techniques, okay, that are, that are employed currently in uh, this aspect of modeling do focus on some type of state, okay? And these are, are three kind of examples of methodologies here. Uh, Bayesian classifiers, Markov models, or engrams. All right. uh, kind of an issue with this approach is that uh, prior work has shown the states really break down very quickly. After two or three states, you really lose uh, really the significant uh, predictability about what the user is going to do next. And that's really what you're aiming for. Based on what the user has done, what are they most likely to want or do next? All right. And this has really uh, been shown in a lot of prior work, uh, including uh, work, original work from NASA in 67 with Meister and Sullivan, really I think the first study that really analyzed a user using transaction logs, really all the way up to the present. So let me give you an example, okay? Um, let's say you, uh, you can take, you can record user interactions, okay? And let's say we have five users here, and we record uh, a state sequence. Okay, and so each of these letters, A through F, represents a particular state. And if you look at an entire transition of a user system interaction, we have a, a, a search string, for example, with four states, three transitions. All right. And so what you can do, uh, and when this approach using engrams, you can say, hey, based on these two states, what's the probability that I can predict that user is going to go to the next state? And so based on the data we have, we can see here uh, on different orders of states, we can come up with different uh, degrees of accuracy, okay, how efficient our modeling works, okay? Now let's put this into like a real example using a search log. Uh, we took about uh, 950,000 search sessions from a working search engine, uh, composed of about a, half, a million and a half queries. And we classified each of the queries based on how the user reformulated the query. Query reformulation is a classic uh, area of information retrieval, information searching. So, you know, the initial query, and then you generalize it or go more specific, switch content collections, whatever. So eight states. So if we look at the accuracy of, uh, of uh, this engram approach and uh, kind of the order of the model, uh, can, will illustrate uh, uh, the difficulty of implementing this particular approach in real, in, with real data. Uh, each of these orders of the models uh, refers to the number of transitions. So a zeroth order model is like no transition, just the user comes, uh, you know, the user is at the first state. And so what we would think is, you know, just a, a highlight of one of the difficulties, you know, the dropout rate uh, for uh, users coming to search engines, and it is about 40%. 40% of the users, 35 to 40% of the users, typically come to search engine and don't do anything. Okay, and then you know there's uh, they may sub uh, submit a query and then not click on anything. All right. So if we look at the different order models, we see you know the kind of the best predictability we get is still under 50%. In other words, based on what the user has already done, what can we predict they're going to do next, right? And um, uh, this particular example is on query reformulation, but it applies to a lot of different uh, uh, scenarios, uh, uh, contextual help, uh, use of interface features, searching, things like that, okay? And uh, so this kind of led to uh, some research I'm doing is looking at maybe states are not the right paradigm to use for this type of user modeling. And so I, I kind of maybe a different paradigm was looking at it as the information stream. 
where uh, they, they, these uh, click logs, these search logs, these transition logs are stateless. So in this kind of, kind of example, we have people all over the world searching 24 by 7, accessing multiple servers. So if we look at that entire uh, record of interaction coming in over multiple servers, a multi-dimensional different type of attributes over time, we can take that entire stream of data, okay, break it up into periods, take each of those periods, slice them up into both vertical and horizontal slices, and so we really end up with a multi-dimensional matrix, a series of matrices that represent the entire stream. Okay. So what uh, this kind of gives us is a, we can view these uh, logs as stateless, and, uh, but with volume, mass, momentum, and acceleration. So if we look at data that's in the past, uh, what if we can take that data and at some point at one slice predict what's going to happen next? Okay, so really uh, the same approach in terms of modeling the user with some degree of probability, but a totally stateless approach. Right? Uh, some kind of just uh, the research I've kind of already done. Uh, I, I've looked at engrams and you know state uh, approaches. Really came up with the same findings that other researchers have came up with. Very very short models seem to work the best. Uh, decision trees. Tried to uh, do classification of user intent, informational, transactional, navigational, and also at different subcategories. And using a very simple approach like a decision tree, we came up with a pretty good degree, degree of accuracy. And uh, the advantage of simple approaches are they can be implemented in real time. All right. uh, clustering, K means clustering. Uh, again, you know, it's uh, beneficial, but still a very state-like approach. Uh, in terms of the temporal aspect, we've looked at uh, time series analysis. And uh, you can come up with a pretty good models of, uh, based on user characteristics, uh, what result they're going to click on. And that's, that's, uh, these are kind of the two areas I focused on, user intent and clicking. Uh, I've looked at neural networks. And again, you can come up within the entire stream, some characteristics of the user, and then predict future click-through rate. And finally, looking at some tensor analysis. Uh, which is, uh, uh, so far, it has, has appeared to be uh, fairly beneficial. And we really found there's multiple trends going on, patterns going on in these streams. And uh, again, some positive and negative correlation between certain characteristics and then user intent and click through. However, you know, really none of these methods are exactly what we want. Uh, they, 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 they act, they capture part of the picture, but really not the entire picture that we're looking for. So I think we really need a different type of methodology to analyze search logs. And we want, uh, I think, a method that can handle a lot of data, that can handle temporal data, multidimensional data, but also allows for segmentation, you know, different user groups, uh, identify patterns in the data, not just one pattern, but multiple patterns. And finally, something that avoids the kind of rear view mirror effect. Any, any method that relies, relies on prior data uh, will work fine as long as the data doesn't change. But once something happens to the data flow, your predictability uh, suffers. So we really want some type of algorithm that can identify really outliers that may be kind of harbingers of future patterns okay, before they actually develop. Right. Uh, so. This is one, one particular narrow slice of, of information searching domain. And with that, uh, let me turn it over to Luke Zhang uh, on visualization. Um, I'm glad Jim Jensen brought up the Google logo things. Actually, on the last day of the Olympics, I saw a logo which put the dragon on the podium. You know, my Chinese name has a dragon. Uh, inside. However, due to cultural difference, I have to explain the difference between the meaning of the dragon in Western culture and the dragon in, Chi in China. Actually, in Chinese, dragon is a symbol of power. The evil side is not that important. But that logo actually shows, oh, dragon can be lovely. So that shows one of the kind of things we can use visualization to explain difficult concept, which I'm going to talk about today. 
And my research area is in human-computer interaction, um, particularly right now, and focusing on knowledge of visualization. And you may hear about information visualization. What I'm trying to do here is to go beyond to search information and then look at what we can provide use of more. So think about the scenario one, we try to find information. Certainly we can find the queries and throw that through Google. Well, we got all this kind of page, right? We have algorithm to rank them. People will pick those top pages. In most scenarios, it would be good enough. However, in scenarios like research, like decision making, and what we want actually, not just this individual page. We may want some kind of structures, such as, well, all this page can be organized in these ways so that we know how they are related to each other. However, due to different purposes, we may have a different kind of structures or different kind of the understanding of the structure. We may have another kind of ways to organize the same sets of information. So what this scenario told us that when we try to understand what we have found online or other resources, we should provide the user not just with the information, but also consider what kind of structures we can help them to organize information and under what context user may need such information. That's why I'm thinking about, we should think about the knowledge of visualization rather than just the information visualization. Of course, knowledge is a very broad term. Here, I'm understanding knowledge visualization as providing structures to organize information and to consider visualization of information within particular contexts, such as the classical context. In general, my research approach is like this. With massive data, I'm trying to use techniques to find out potential structures or context, and then visualize, visualize information as well as structures. Later, user can somehow control the process of structure, context finding, as well as visualization. So there are some challenges here. However, first, how can we obtain those structures, right? And we can find the information, but how about the structures? This is a big challenge here. And one of the ways we can look at is to think about what people have done in other sciences, such as library science. And if you look at ACM digital library or catalogs in libraries, actually people have done a lot of things by organized information in formally defined structures, such as catalogs, ACM categories. So we can somehow borrow existing structures to help us organize information. Another way to look at a structure is that, how about those uh, scientific data where you may not be find out uh, semantic description? And I have another project is called MMDA, it's multi-dimensional multi-scale data analysis. And I'm not sure why I can show the video. Uh, let me show you the uh, figures. So this is a side sense system. Uh, actually, if you look at the overall system, we have a query window, we have a knowledge context window, we have a workspace window. Somehow, in the query window, you can throw all kinds of queries and results will be displayed as, as trees and structure possible. This part shows the knowledge uh, structure. Somehow in ACM, you will, you will know the structures and you will see the different nodes. Actually, in our system, we allow users to drag nodes to reorganize uh, in your workspace. For example, you know, um, not just selecting individual papers. Somehow, by the end, you can organize all the search results in a way which allow you to reuse in the future. Also, allow other people to reuse. For, in this case, uh, these papers are organized as a hierarchy. We got the theory, on the theory, have design theory, we had the cognitive theory, and so on. So eventually, we hope this kind of approach will allow us to go beyond search engine and think about the search engine of structures. Okay, um, there are other challenges in terms of the context. What kind of ta context we're talking about? And con again, context is a very broad term. Here, I'm considering tasks. What information is used, how, you, how people use information. So there are some uh, dimensions we can consider, such as how we can provide different representation styles so that people will uh, adapt their actions based on information or the vice versa. Uh, what kind of the styles of representation going beyond the static. Think about how we can provide dynamic animated views 
or to think about not just about individual users, but also about the collaborative decision making and so on. So um, let me give you one example about uh, task oriented uh, information visualization. Think about the we finding scenario where we try to plan our routes and drive to the destination. In cognitive science and geography, it's well known that people actually have different kinds of tasks in the whole wayfinding process. We need planning where people need 2D actrocentric maps so that we know where to go. However, when we follow a particular route, actually people want to egocentric map to show head up the directions. And when we approach a decision making point, point such as intersections, people usually need to find those reference buildings or uh, sailing the object to help us know where should I make a turn. So in this case, visualization will not just show you the 2D maps, but also 2D and, oh, 2D and 2.5D eventually provide a immersive 3D environment so that you will see the salient buildings where you can rely on in decision making. Oh, it's frozen again? Okay. Yeah, um, my future research will focus on several things. First, we try to expand the site sense project by considering collaborative sense making. Uh, right now, one of the projects we are working on is to provide web-based uh, services which allow users to search ACM plus uh, Google Scholar. And we try to go um, another direction about the mobile wayfinding uh, research by considering how people can use mobile devices in emergency situation where you do not have a time. You do not have the um, you know, uh, cognitive resources to think about what road road you should uh, find out. Eventually, um, this will be a very important entry point for us to combine mobile device visualization and the geospatial visualization. Another project I'm working on right now is geo-collaborative decision-making pro uh, project. It's a web-based decision-making uh, system which is platform dependent, uh, independent. So this URL actually can go to check this uh, project. As you can see right now, we have uh, two Google Maps. One is a private map, another public map. Actually, people from different locations can collaborate on decision-making. They can draw a diagram to show where are the areas you have problems, and different visualization techniques show who they are and what they have done. And at the bottom, we got visualization tools to help users to aggregate information and then to help to see what has been done by whom. So eventually, we, we, we hope we can come up with design guidelines to support this web-based geo-collaboration support system so that Google Maps will be used not just for individual purposes, but also in collaborative decision-making process. Um, if you are interested in more about the project and research, you can go to my website to find the details. Thank you. Let me need to change the order because this is older slides. That's okay. Thank you. Uh, if I talk about decision making uh, research, uh, I would like to kind of use an analogy that motivates this research. Uh, People who study human team performance have indicated that a good uh, characteristic or characteristic of a good team, a high performance team, typically is that the capability members of the team could anticipate needs of teammates and then send information to them before they ask and without overloading them. And they know what they need, when to tell them, and so forth. So the motivation of this research is try to develop technologies to help machines to be able to move in that direction. Uh, and an important component in that direction then is to have some sense about what people is needed and be able to then use that information to drive information seeking behavior or provide knowledge visualization and so forth. So uh, that is the motivation and the vision of our research. Uh, and we look into uh, cognitive theories to draw, to draw inspiration of our research. And um, because we are not only interested in decision making per se, but rather the linkage between decision making and information seeking behavior. Uh, therefore, uh, we are interested in this holistic 
decision-making process, not just decision-making point. Uh, in the decision-making paradigm, uh, the naturalist decision-making paradigm is uh, capturing, has captured the process, the holistic aspect of decision-making. Of course, there's also rational decision-making, uh, which focus on uh, rationality, boundary rationality, and, and so forth. Uh, the, so the, uh, the research in naturalist decision-making has developed uh, resulted in very small. The one of them is uh, recon recognition prime decision uh, uh, developed by uh, Dr. Gary Klein. Um, and so that has provided the cognitive uh, foundations for our research. Uh, so this is a graphic uh, representation of the RPD model. Uh, the main idea, there are different several pieces of the uh, main idea behind RPD model. Uh, first of all, RPD is uh, modeling decision making under time stress. Uh, obviously, different kinds of decision environment will result in different kinds of decision making. For example, decision making for jury is very different because you have much more time. Um, so, one element of the RPD is the process of uh, identifying missing information. Uh, the RPD involves matching the current situation with experience of the human decision maker. And based on that process, it may identify, say, well, what's relevant cue, and I don't have information for that cue. And that drives the information seeking aspect of the RPD process. Uh, and so that uh, certainly is rel very relevant to what we want to do. The other uh, kind of information requirement in RPD framework is the monitoring uh, the evaluation of different options uh, and through uh, mental simulation or other means uh, to try to evaluate those different options to see which one uh, is better. And the third type of information uh, requirement is related to expectancy monitoring, which monitor the situation after a decision is made to detect anomaly, to detect surprises, or to detect you know, success and, and so forth. Of course, especially when anomaly or failure occurs, that it may enable the human decision maker to adapt, uh, to respond, and, and so forth. So RPD model is also an adaptive decision making model. Now, RPD is a quote, cognitive model. So taking those concepts and realize it in a computational model uh, require uh, you know, some uh, you know, kind of a mapping the construct in cognitions into computational component and, infrastructure and inference capabilities. Uh, and we uh, created RCAS agent technology based on that. Uh, there are different ways to present RCAS architectures instead of the traditional agent uh, framework to use the sense, uh, reasoning, and action cycles. Usually I prefer to present RCAS uh, by focusing on how it anticipates information requirements, which is the top portion of the architectures, and how that, info, that component interacts with the uh, corresponding uh, complementary functions in manage information requirements, including gathering information requirements. Uh, and so the two together result in a kind of a smart push, you may say, uh, that use the context which is defined by the decision process models together with the uh, relevant experience, and that uh, result in uh, different kinds of information requirements. The three I mentioned earlier are the high-level examples. Uh, then there's an information manager, which I then determine whether information is already in the system or in the, in the machine or needs to uh, be uh, gathered from other sources uh, using um, through communication uh, manager. So this indicate how different pieces of the RPD is mapped into the different pieces of the RCAST. So the information that's required can come from multiple sources, you know, can be known, already known in the agent, can be inferred, can be obtained from external services, or can be obtained from uh, also humans uh, decisions or other agents. So it's inherently a collaborative, very much a service-oriented uh, framework. Uh, and it shows that the inference uh, technique actually, even though the inference technique is forward uh, triggering, but actually the information 
uh, need reasoning is uh, backward inference. And we have uh, developed a, a various application, including an application is the Navy domains. Um, in terms of uh, future research, Jim, you want to talk your part? <laughs> well, yeah, it's, uh, I'm really trying to look for a, um, uh, maybe a combination of, our, uh, our, uh, of current methodologies to really uh, get away from a state-based uh, analysis of data, of data and look at it more as a, as a, a stream of information. And I really kind of outlined, uh, you know, kind of a method I'm, I'm looking at. And so uh, that, that's, that's where my particular uh, research is going. And I'm really focusing on being able to some type of not only descriptive model, but some type of predictive model. That's okay. Where I can predict what the next user, what the next user's action is. All right. And uh, so. Uh, Luke? Uh, I just mentioned my uh, future research uh, previously. Somehow, I'm trying to see how we can provide um, somehow platform independent web-based uh, user interface. Also, look at the mobile device. For example, for emerging wayfinding, right now we have iPhones, we have all kinds of the PDA phones, which allow us, allow us to access not just Google Map, but also Google Earth, which can combine 2D, 3D. The problem here is that how we can tailor the representation of information to the cognition, because so far right now, Google Earth, the 3D stuff, sometimes is too overwhelming for people to understand what's going on. So how can combine that together to adapt the visualization to people's cognition? Uh, geo collaboration, as I showed, and there's a great potential for us to look at how we can use open resources to support decision making. Um, one of the plans of our current research to get people from Homeland Department, Homeland Security Department to look at how they can use our system as well as Google service. And because it's a Google map are not just a proper writer service, but also you can collect information from other people. Then the whole decision making, become, decision -making scenario becomes a very open process rather than closed door uh, process. Uh, Dr. Prasanjit Mitra uh, is also doing work uh, in temporal and social mining area. Uh, because of the time limitation, I will just uh, go through this part uh, relatively quickly, and uh, hopefully he will, uh, if you are interested, uh, please feel free to contact him. He uh, has expressed interest also, hopefully, to uh, be able to visit Google also sometime in the future. And the problem he's looking at is to detect overlapping events in temporal and social text stream, such as blogs. Um, and and the, his research involved three uh, components or three uh, aspects of it, the hierarchical topic clustering, and then the temporal segmentations uh, based on that clustering result. And the third is use social and information flow analysis to help to identify a relevant event and topic. And the, this is a graphical representation of the three steps I talk about. Uh, clustering is the first step, and then temporal segmentation is the second, and the third step is information flow pattern-based uh, graph analysis uh, for event detection. So the main idea here is try to combine content and the temporal aspect and the social interactions of the block all together into this analysis for event and, and topic. And also the byproduct of that is also the outcome in help to not only see the uh, trend or the change of event and interest over time, but also how it interact with the social network involved and how it, uh, so the interaction between the two. And therefore, the uh, problem 
involved three dimensions, the content dimension, the temporal dimension, and the social dimensions. And the goal then is to analyze this uh, so that uh, in terms of the topic, uh, we also can leverage uh, topic structures such as a hierarchy for better analysis. Uh, this is a graph-based uh, uh, topic uh, uh, clustering technique and temporal segmentations technique. Uh, and this is an example of the outcome of uh, temporal segmentation result. Here we see a uh, topic six, which is shown in blue, and topic 16, which is shown in purple, uh, kind of has a overlapping but a slightly different uh, lifespan. Uh, and so that's kind of the, uh, the outcome that his research is, is looking at. Uh, and then Luke talked about visualization. And here is another example where visualization play an important role from uh, visualizing the outcome of this event analysis. And he has applied this technique to two different data set. The Enron data set involved messages between employees. A lot of uh, KDD research has been done in that area. Uh, he's look, he has looked at that also. Another area he's looking at, uh, which is uh, more interesting, involved block data set. And uh, this is an experiment result uh, indicating uh, the outcome of his approach seems uh, to be quite promising, which is shown uh, in the, the, uh, the light blue line, the TIF, indicated by the TIF uh, line, which uh, suggests an uh, interesting result. And these are some of the related papers uh, that he has published, he and his uh, uh, team has published. And, um, and then in closing, uh, the decision-making research I talked about earlier, we are also interested in linking the uh, decision-making information seeking, uh, uh, information requirement generation to uh, relevant content on the web uh, through, um, uh, through perhaps uh, you know, in event detections and, and trend detections and other kinds of uh, uh, technique that look at uh, uh, the, uh, the all kinds of information out there uh, on the web. And uh, so uh, I close here, and uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Yes, please. So my question is related to information seeking as the first presenter did. And I thought that's very exciting and interesting. And oh, great. Thank you. So one thing that kept coming to my mind when you were explaining it was you never talked about user characteristics or tasks anywhere in your presentation. So you were trying to decontextualize your analysis. So uh, is there a possibility that some of those characteristics are confounding and mangling the patterns you're getting out of it? You might be better off trying to separate those and say, oh, look, for this particular set of users, I can, this can predict, this technique can predict, while the, for the other set of users, it's not good. So do you think that would be a good direction to move in? Are you planning to do so? Yeah, the, uh, the question was about uh, uh, really segmenting uh, the information stream, I think, is a way to, I would, if I understood the question correctly. And yeah, you know, you brought some really good points there. Uh, and uh, the, that I think uh, there are, or I think research has pointed out there are some different classes of users that, uh, you know, in, in just an area of web searching, you know, some very uh, uh, really naive users fact-finding things, a uh, very e-commerce e type group. Uh, I, I would alter it a little bit that it's not really users, but it's task. That, you know, at different times we all have different roles that we play uh, in information seeking. So, yeah, I, I think in, in Given those different tasks and contexts, yes, certainly segmenting those tasks into different areas would, is a beneficial approach. Yeah. And uh, I think any type of uh, robust methodology would have to do that. And the approach, so the approach I'm taking is um, the data that is collected is very sparse. I mean, you really have an IP address, a cookie, uh, some queries, uh, maybe some clickstream data, uh, you know, and, and it's, that's about it. So you really have to start, I think, enriching the data set, you know. And there are certainly some approaches to, that, to do that in terms of, you know, can you determine user intent? Can you maybe determine a topic or domain area? Uh, can you classify some type of commercial intent? 
And uh, so the, I, the, I think the richer profile you can make of this task, the better. And then I think you can really then narrow in on that particular group of tasks and say, okay, can we, what predictive models can, can we come out of that? And so, yeah, and, and I, uh, I've been really focusing on the clickstream axis. of can we predict whether a user will click on an organic link or a sponsored link, for example, because I think that really has some high payoff for, for a lot of reasons. So, but yeah, I, I, I think that really is the way to go, the one you suggested. about visualization. So let me go back to the original work by Goldsmith. And in her work, she looked at text, text comprehension. And, and the point was, when someone reads a text, then there are three perspectives going on. One is the writer's perspective, what are they trying to convey? One is the reader's perspective, what they are reading. And the third one is the, you know, the, the perspective that comes out of interaction between those two. So my question is, while we have a nice uh, visualization system, do they take into account those kind of uh, interactions and do they support uh, building or uh, you know, helping develop those interactions so the user can put some in feedback in to, uh, to better understand the system rather than just taking the system or algorithmic view of the knowledge structure? So it's kind of how did you help support amalgamate those two perspectives in information position? OK, uh, your question is about the, the gap between creator structures and the user structure, right? and how we can address that issue. Uh, that's a good question. Actually, um, in several disciplines, such as uh, in philosophy, also, well, also in the information science, some people argue there are kind of difference between uh, observers and the creators, and between, um, it's, it's called observational structures or definitional structure, or information science is called the categorical structure or situational structure. So in your case, the creators, are more about you know, definitional structures or uh, categorical structures are formally defined. But for users, it's very situated. So it's less formally designed. And my goal is somehow to help users to migrate from situational or observational structure to more formally defined categorical or definitional structure. You are right. It's, it's a big challenge to help users to find such kind of the uh, well, very well-defined structure as well as useful. And the example I just showed you is first a step to look at how we can obtain those definite structures or uh, categoric structures. Right now, we do not have resources online about what your knowledge structures about certain classroom papers. And as I mentioned, our future um, research, one of the ways to let users to store their collections as well as structures. As I showed you in the personal collection, you will see a hierarchy structure. And we are building a server service so that you, know, you can save your results. And then when people search similar queries, they will, they will get the information about, OK, this is the papers. And these are somehow relevant structures you might be interested. And to me, this might be the first step to let people to reuse others. Gradually, we will see kind of the activity to rebuild, uh, to build the personal structures which are available to all the communities or society. And from my point of view right now, we, we can find some formally defined structure. However, for practical structures or situation structures, we still have a long way to go. And my point is that we have information over there. We have some structure over there, but we need to kind of the process and services to let people to do that. Thank you. Uh, uh, for the third speaker, uh, last speaker, uh, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, I, I forgot the name. So you talked about decision making, and one of the key components in decision making is the knowledge you have, the information or the knowledge base. And to me, it seems like from your presentation, right now you have a very formal knowledge base, and you're trying to shift towards more informal knowledge base with the recent work that you presented. So. What do you think is the right middle ground between formal and informal knowledge base to, to support these kind of decision-making processes? So the question is, what is the middle ground between formal and informal representation of the knowledge? That's an excellent question. Well, I think it goes, there, there are two, there are two, two aspects of your, your, your question. Um, one is the, uh, uh, the 
the semantic web uh, trend and the meta tag uh, help and the you know, event analysis, trend analysis, which extract higher level knowledge structures out of you know, structural, uh, you know, semi-structured informations. And so that provide a higher level semantics to connect to uh, the you know, more formal representation. Uh, and then, but on the other hand, I think the, another important trend th these days, for, you know, let me use network as an example. Right? Network on s itself is a knowledge structure built on top of other information. Uh, but then it also serves as a kind of information for extracting further knowledge out of it. Uh, so wh while we, I think network example, you know, just example where it's, a, I think, a good, uh, another candidate for a, a kind of a mediator or intermediate uh, between the, the, the uh, you know, conventional view of uh, information and the conventional view about the knowledge. It's, it's really something in between. And I think it uh, provides a very important and rich construct to allow you know, for another kind of bridge that can be built between inf informal and formal representations. But that's just an example. But you know, it's, a, it's a great question, I think. Uh, uh, the, and I think the, the trend, and oh, another part of this is uh, another piece that's also related is the human, right? your, your question also earlier about human and users and, and so forth. So uh, when the system uh, make a recommendation to the user and the user can has override, can interact with the system, it provides opportunity for the system to learn about the interactions. In fact, another research we are working on on related area is also the trust relationship between recommend, recommendation and, and, uh, uh, and the user. And, uh, uh, and so that's actually not at the uh, kind of semi-formal or formal, it's more at the relationship level you know, between uh, the machine and the user. And that is also a very interesting area. So the, if that loop can be enhanced, then the system can also uh, learn not only the user preference or possibly down the line user knowledge if there's enough data uh, available, but also uh, enhancing the relationship by better understanding how user view the system and then adapt based on that. Any other question? Okay. Yes. Just to expand on this question, so, so this brings a rather interesting point of uh, rational smart contract processing which is supposed to go through versus the blink process where in the recent book that came out the people they could download you know, this part you know, with very little information. So what is the right role of those two processes within the CNC system? Like comment on that? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? So I think this brings up another interesting question is the rational process that, or the rational thought or process the system goes through when making a decision or recommending something versus the blink process in which the human makes decision on spot with very little information or reflection. And sometimes those are correct. You know, I don't know what, the, what exact percentage, but a lot of time. So is there a role of that kind of a quick decision process, uh, decision suggestions or support in the system? And how do we, if there is a role of those kind of uh, you know, support, then how do we uh, embed those or you know, integrate those kind of uh, decisions uh, recommendation to the, the well thought or uh, knowledge based recommendations? So what is your uh, opinion on that? Thank you. Uh, well, it's, a, it's an excellent question, too. Uh, I guess uh, there are two responses I can think of. Uh, first is, uh, the, to some degree, the naturalist decision-making uh, attempt to model the more kind of a making decision on the spot, kind of blink type you know, decisions. Uh, and the, the way we realize it, they feel actually kind of closer to the rational Type because actually, once we, we represent it, then it's formal, once, and the computer can run faster, so there's no less point of saying, well, I just stop on the first uh, 
solutions. If I have time, then just you know, evaluate all of the options. So it actually could go into a more rational-like decision making. So the, the more fundamental question, I guess, probably is uh, the, 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 the deeper insight about human cognitions that is uh, you know, sometimes uh, richer, you know, may involve you know, uh, more kind of a uh, uh, creative, you know, let me use this term, creative aspect, whether it's in recall or problem solving process. And I think that's an uh, area, hopefully, uh, there can be you know, groundbreaking uh, breakthrough down the line. And I think that's an area where uh, neurologists, uh, cognition, uh, cognitive scientists and, and uh, computer scientists can all collaborate and contribute. Um, and uh, but I, I think that's an, uh, that's a that would that would be I think a very exciting uh, uh, directions because once we we can have better insight about those and then can can then realize some of those into computational cognitive model that add those elements into it, then the 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 reasoning or processing or decision making model then would be you know even even richer. Of course, then there's still two competing well not competing two two different goals here. One is modeling cognition, human cognition versus supporting human cognition. Right. So it would be you know interesting to to model human cognition on the creative process, but then it may introduce additional challenge on the trust aspect because if the machine become too creative. You know, it may introduce additional challenge for the user to, to, to uh, adopt it and, uh, and, and get used to its creativity and so forth. So, so it's a two-way street, but I think that's a, that's a very important direction because I, I think that those are all interrelated creativity uh, and, and kind of intuitive problem solving and, and uh, um, decision making. Thank you very much. Thank you.